Thank you for joining us. One of our major concerns in life is that of our health. And our guest today is the Chancellor of the Nova Southeastern University Health Professions Division, Dr. Fred Lipman. His impressive professional credentials include his background as a pharmacist, an entrepreneur, a professor, and a state legislator here in Florida. And now he is leading the Health Professions Division at Nova Southeastern University. We'll discuss trends in healthcare and education following these messages. On November 6th, Election Day in the USA, a delegation of 20 American doctors came to Rambam Healthcare Campus in Haifa, northern Israel. The delegates are members of the American Physicians Fellowship for Medicine in Israel. Most are Jewish American Zionist doctors who have joined together to help the Israeli medical system. They are called emergency medical volunteers that are supposed to come here during times of need. And if something happens and we need some support, these people already signed in and are volunteers to come to Israel. The organization gives fellowships to Israeli doctors for advanced training abroad, but one of its main goals is to prepare American doctors to come to Israel in an emergency to work as medical system volunteers. During their visit to Rambam, the doctors were given a survey of the hospital's emergency network and toured the emergency room and the nearly complete fortified underground emergency hospital. I think it's uh, extremely impressive uh, just how you're able to turn a whole parking garage within two days into a full-fledged hospital. I have actually a lot of family that live here in Haifa and it gives me peace of mind knowing that, because I remember the war from six years ago uh, and calling them every night, finding out everyone's okay, to see everyone know that they will have this place to be secure and safe. and. Um, it's just amazing the abilities here within just a quick time frame, we're talking only five years, to realize the need and to see it in fruition is amazing. The American doctors have promised that they will come to Israel to help in a crisis, for example, by taking the place of Israeli surgeons and other doctors who have been called to the battlefront. Joining us now is Dr. Fred Lipman, Chancellor of the Nova Southeastern University School of Medicine. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you very much, except uh, I would calmly, uh, respectfully tell you that it's not the School of Medicine, it's the Health Professions Division, which has eight colleges and 19 programs. Well, I stand corrected, and it's been quite a while since I last had the pleasure of having you on a show. Thank you. Good to be back. What's new in your world of medical educational areas? What's new? Well, I think uh, education in general is going through a dramatic metamorphosis, if not a revolution. I think the, uh, the application of uh, new techniques, uh, new uh, attitudes by the public in accepting education, not necessarily in a building uh, that has bricks and mortar, but through electronic means, uh, but uh, generally the, the bottom line to a quality education is still the interchange between the teaching professional, in our case it's usually physicians or pharmacists or dentists or other health professionals, and the student, because the, the direct correlation between having a qualified health professional is the mentorship and the ability to have clinical oversight directly by the academician. How is technology influencing the efficiency in which you can teach? Oh, it's, it's dramatic. It's dramatic. For example, uh, in uh, four of our colleges, uh, starting this year, uh, we will be using a uh, total uh, pad type of devices in our classrooms 
So there'll be a direct interchange between the, the teaching professional and the, the pad information. We're using, we have been using in a couple of, two or three of our programs, uh, what generally is called e-books. In other words, we don't have textbooks. They're all uploaded through the corporations into our pads or into our uh, laptop computers in, in some uh, of our elements. But uh, the, the whole efficiency of uh, capturing education, keeping the knowledge in one place, uh, not necessarily in your, in your computer, but in the wireless and ether areas, uh, and immediately capturing it for the, your utilization is dramatic. It's, it's really changing the whole concept of education. And of course you can implement distance learning and immediately constantly update your material. Well, distance learning is something which was the basis. We, uh, your next guest is Dr. Abraham Vishla, who is the, one of the pioneers, the great pioneers in what I would call distant learning at the time, but they call it distance learning. But now that technology is involved, uh, we use a great deal of uh, what we call mixed modality. We have people that will show up in the classroom for two or three days or nights, uh, plus learn online at their time and, and uh, set period of time that they can communicate with their teaching professional. Tell us please what more is unique about your school? Unique about Nova Southeastern University? Well, f I, I think one of the most unique things and uh, I you know whether it's it's by happenstance or by the way that we were created uh, we're sort of an upside, upside down venture when it comes to major universities. Don't forget, we are America's eighth or ninth largest not-for-profit private institution in the country with over 28,000 matriculants. So we're very large. But we're 80% post-baccalaureate. In other words, when we only have 20% undergrads and 80% post-baccalaureate uh, students who are graduate students and first professional students. That's very unusual. So what does that mean to the public or the people that are viewing the show? It means that what we're doing, particularly in the health professions division, uh, we're providing what has been designated by whether you read the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg News or whatever it is, as the greatest need for uh, uh, educated individuals are in the fields of health care over the next two decades in the United States. So uh, we feel that we're, we're answering that call. So what is unique? What is unique is that we've been uh, very uh, uh, forward-looking. We, we, we didn't stay in the, in the mold or the cast of, uh, shall we say, some of our wonderful sister schools. I mean, I'm a graduate of Columbia University, as Dr. Fischler is in one of his ventures in education, but uh, we're different. I mean, we're different because uh, uh, we have smaller classes, uh, we have a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one teaching, and uh, we have this great venture of, like I said, uh, graduate study programs. Sir, I once had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Robert Mendelssohn, who I believe was the president of the American Medical Association at one point, and then to the astonishment and horror of the medical establishment, he wrote a book entitled Confessions of a Medical Heretic, uh, basically disagreeing with a lot of what occurs in the medical field at the time. What are your thoughts with regard to being open-minded in general in education with a view to alternative medicines and alternative health care? Well, Firstly, I, I don't know. The word alternative is not... It, it, I really, really think of uh, complementary, alternative, integrative, complementary, all being the same. But really what it really gets down to is that the people who are viewing your show want one thing. They want a longer life. They want a life where they have some feeling that they can be independent and that they uh, can depend upon the healthcare system to give them that longer life and independence. Uh, I, I think that uh, the minds of all healthcare professionals, not only physicians, uh, but the dentists, pharmacists, optometrists, nurses, etc., the, the PAs, PTs, OTs, you name it, 
they all have learned that they have to work with one another. So in essence, they are complementing each other and they're integrating into each other's profession the knowledge of that other specialty. The best of both worlds. It's more than the best. It's one and one doesn't equal two. It's sort of one and one equals eight. Speaking of uh, other theories, I was asked to present you with this book as a gift. Bill asked me to give this to you, and you may find it interesting. Okay. A bit controversial, perhaps, but anyway, the more thought... There's no the such thing as controversial uh, knowledge. You have an interesting background. You were uh, in politics. You started as a pharmacist. If you don't mind, share with our audience some of your experiences. Well, do you have about three, four hours so we can talk? We do. Uh, well, I, firstly, I, I'm, I'm a product of a, of a, I'm a first generation American. I, I come from proud immigrants from Europe. Uh, I was educated in the, the public school system of New York City and then I had the privilege of attending Columbia University. Uh, I then went on to the College of Pharmacy. I, I was a pharmacy professional from uh, 1960 uh, to about uh, 85, 86. Uh, I, uh, to be candid, I was rather successful in my ventures. Uh, but in 1978, I also took it upon myself, uh, not for any glory, but because I wanted to do some things to change the policies, I uh, ascended to a position of being a member of the House of Representatives in the state of Florida. Now, don't ask me why I stayed for 20 years, I can't tell you, but I, I feel very privileged that I did have that period of time. Uh, I still was gainfully employed wherever I was. I, I worked, I owned my own pharmacies, and then after I sold my pharmacies, Dr. Morton Terry, who was the founder of then Southeastern University of Health Sciences, came to me one day and said, why don't you do something worthwhile? And uh, he asked me if I would uh, uh, put together an opportunity and an overview of uh, the, p the possible creation of a college of pharmacy. So that, was, that began my educational career. Uh, then after doing that, uh, I had also the privilege of being uh, one of the uh, four people that uh, were the merger team that put Southeastern University together with Nova University and became Nova Southeastern University. So from there it uh, goes on. Uh, uh, I found myself going back into the classroom and going to that wonderful school called the Official School of Education to get my doctorate degree. Uh, that was probably one of the most frightening things that ever happened to me because I had, been, had not been in a classroom in over 30 years and here I was back in a classroom. Uh, it took seven plus years, but I guess it was worth it. And uh, that's the short history. Richard, there's one thing that I want to just add to uh, my, as a sort of a postscript as to what I just said. Uh, you, you said uh, that I was a politician. I really never viewed myself as a politician. I, used, I really viewed myself really as a community uh, interest leader uh, because all, all of my prior years to the time that I went into elected office, I did things like I sat on the South Broward Hospital District Board of Commissioners, I was chairman of the Broward Charter Study Commission, things of that nature, which I did not because I needed to do it for the purposes of inuring benefits for myself, but I really felt a responsibility to basically my customers and the people that I, that I, that I lived with and, and, uh, and uh, walked with uh, throughout life. So I, you know, that sounds very, uh, very ecumenical and very uh, white hatish, but that's the reality. And so very few people at that point in time could sort of point at me and say, oh, you're one of those. You're a, you're a, you're a conservative, you're a liberal, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat. I don't know. I, I don't think that people really looked at me that way, at least in my observation. I don't think so. Well, there's so many labels in our world, unfortunately, and there should be more cooperation. And of course, that brings me to the word research. It so happens I'd like to convey greetings from Baroness Susan Greenfield of Oxford University. I'm going to see her next week. And she's interested in what you're doing here at NOVA. And She's involved with Alzheimer's research. She's, she's a neuroscientist leading a research team. But what are your thoughts with regard to innovation, medical innovation, healthcare in the future?
I think what's happening now in, in healthcare is it, it's going so fast. It's it's not just geometric uh, increases in knowledge. It's it, it's jumping so quickly, uh, and that's because of, uh, to tell you the truth, the ability of uh, technology and computer uh, capabilities of helping the human intellect uh, decipher everything very quickly. Uh, we had the, the math geniuses of yesteryear that used to use slide rules, but it would take time, uh, whereas a supercomputer can make those determinations in nanoseconds, and it's very, very helpful. But with reference to research, uh, Nova Southeastern University is on the cusp of becoming a major research powerhouse. Uh, we're, we're going to be breaking ground in September of the largest uh, collaborative research building in the state of Florida. It's a 220,000 square foot building that will deal with everything from neuro, neurologic uh, disease issues to uh, cardiac issues to uh, the environmental issues. It will be a huge boon to the uh, research community of the world because the research community is no longer just centered in one institution. Uh, because of, uh, of the ability to interact and communicate with other scientists around the world, the Baroness could be talking to our people, not, you know, one-on-one -on -one in the same room as if she was sitting across the table. So that, and the exchange of information in a secure uh, type of transmission uh, is very, very important to scientists. And we will have that capacity here at Nova Southeastern University. It's all about teamwork. Thank you so very much for being with us today, sir. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. The way I see the future is building of the next generation operating room, replacing traditional surgery by non-invasive outpatient procedure. Insitec was established in January 99. The company developed a breakthrough technology that in essence allows to treat human beings without cutting the body. We developed technology and systems that are capable to destroy targets deep inside the body, completely non-invasive. The unique part of InsightTech is that all this procedure is being done under real-time monitoring and control of treatment outcome. So the user is capable to change treatment parameters on the fly, not in retrospect, and achieve the desired outcome. The main part of the system is the transducer that transmit the ultrasound waves from this area here. This has thousand elements in it. Each one of them is electronically controlled by a complicated electronic system together with mechanics, software that supports it. Each one of those elements are transmitting the ultrasound waves focusing at the treatment point. The technology allows us to treat almost any tumor inside the body. We started with uterine fibroids. It's a huge problem. About 25% of the women will suffer from significant symptomatic effects. Today, the gold standard is hysterectomy. Patient is going through hysterectomy, then our, she will be hospitalized for a couple of days, let's say it's three to five at the hospital, sent home and will recover weeks it'll take to recover. In our treatment, next day the patient is back to her life, work, family, whatever. It's a dramatic change for the women. Step two was turning into oncology. We selected a specific application which is metastatic bone tumor. It's a palliative treatment. The next one, which is in many ways the holy grail of this technology, is brain treatments. We are treating central nervous system diseases like Parkinson, like essential tremor. We've seen patients that for tens of years suffered from this disease. 
leaving the table immediately post-treatment with no tremor. We'll definitely look uh, as a next step on brain tumors, prostate cancer, liver tumors, breast cancer, and so on and so on. Eventually, we see it as a next generation operating room, centralized service in the hospital. I've done my first degree in physics and mathematics in Jerusalem. And then I moved to the Technion and done my first engineering degree in electrical engineering and then continued directly into PhD in electro-optics. In parallel, I started working at Rafael. During my days at Rafael, we had a very tight collaboration with a couple of laboratories and researchers uh, at the Technion. And as team, combined team, we worked on a couple of breakthrough programs that in essence still now are playing a major role in the defense of Israel. When we started in SciTech, the whole R&D team came from the Technion. I would say I had a hard time to persuade the leaders to interview anyone from any other institute in Israel to an extreme. It was a Technion-based company, so this is ongoing relations, and I would guess that we are at least 80% from our R&D team is coming from the Technion. The main challenge in developing this neo brain system was to be able to penetrate the skull, the non-uniform skull, and still get the focal point of the waves in the required spot in the brain. This was never done before by any company and add to it the idea of having everything MRI guided makes it very complicated involving so many disciplines and I would say excellency in science and technology. In many ways uh, the system itself is a Star Trek system because the notion that you could place someone on the table, look at him using MRI, and then three hours later, this guy is riding his bike back home, is something that, for, for at least in my generation, is still perceived as, guys, send me a postcard when this will be ready, okay? Um, in reality, the system exists and doing it today. We have a lot of dreams, unlimited enough of, of uh, amount of dreams, in almost everything you touch, there is a chance to do something different. Think about stroke. Think about the possibility that this technology will be able to liquefy clot in the brain really fast within these first three to four and a half hours and get free flow back again to the brain and save the brain. Another different idea is targeted drug delivery. So we could generate significantly higher toxicities at the targeted volume while avoiding or sparing the whole body. So the way I see it and dream about it is doing huge change in medicine and helping millions of people globally. So hi, my name is Shahar Levery and I am uh, from Israel. I'm a PhD researcher. I work in the Tel Aviv Medical Center which is a large hospital, 1,100 beds. I'm a director of the lab of herbal medicine and cancer research. I've been doing the work since end of 2006, and then I took my wife and we went to the school in Germany. We went together, it was lovely, 2008. The work is very alive in Israel, so it's a lot of fun. I have my own lab, which is on cancer research, cellular biology and herbs. I worked with cancer patients in groups and also uh, in a clinic. And you know, cancer patients, usually when this disease comes, there is a lot of uh, fear, a lot of stress, there is guilt, anxiety. And I found the work that it's so beneficial for these patients. By inquiring the thoughts, it just had amazing effect on the quality of life. Just seeing how to live with the cancer. One of the things that uh, I saw was a friend of mine. She had um, a terminal cancer and she was young. She was about uh, 37 uh, years old. Once the cancer was diagnosed, she was so much in fear and confusion. She had two small children. She didn't know what to do and she was so afraid. 
And while the process, she studied the process, she did, she did many things, she did many integrative medicine, but I think mainly the work helped her to be very creative because she lived much above the expectations. Like she lived three years, not like 10 months or six months. But in these years she lived, like she was able to, to be an artist, which she never was an artist. She was, she was able to produce herself artists. She was able to find herself peace and find herself um, uh, with her kids doing uh, amazing things and being until I think the last moment being being joyful. And uh, I know that her husband says that it was the, the three most amazing years they had together as a family. She was just the opposite example, which for me created the um, wanting to to use it more. We want to do research on this. To, so the clinical effect, we can see that it's, it's, a, it's very uh, evident and we want to put it in uh, evidence-based research to statistically prove that I and uh, other people I hear uh, have seen in a clinic. I think it can help a lot of people. This concludes our special program for today from On Location at Nova Southeastern University. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.